Uh, well, it's a privilege to be preaching from uh, God's Word this morning as we seek to mark and acknowledge uh, the conclusion of Matt's time as pastor here at Engadine Kong. Uh, please keep your Bibles open to Matthew 25 and um, to allow for the time of thanks and appreciation that we've shared, which was wonderful. This talk is planned to be shorter than normal, so uh, don't be too concerned by the time. Um, As we begin, I want to ask you, uh, what words do you long to hear when Jesus returns? What do you want his response to be, either at the end of your earthly life or when he returns, whatever happens first? As you cast your mind forward to that event, to that occasion, what do you want to hear? What do you long to receive? What do you want that experience to be like for you? Now, we hope that Matt's not nearing the end of his life. But as it comes to the end of his ministry here as pastor, what would he long to hear? We've already heard, as I said, some wonderful words of thanks and appreciation from our church family here. But but what kind of response would he like to hear and receive from his Lord and Saviour? I'm sure, Matt, I'm sure all of us would long for those words to be positive words that Jesus' response would be one of encouragement and affirmation. Well, what if I was to tell you that there was a way in which we could be sure that that will be the case? What if there was a way to live, a way to respond to Jesus and what he's done that would ensure that that would happen? Jesus himself, the one whose return we're talking about, will help us to see how that can be so. So before we look at his parable this morning, let's pray and ask for his help. Lord, we thank you that you taught us everything we need to know about your return. And that you helped us to see how we can be ready for your return, how we can live so as to make the best use of our lives. And we pray that as we consider just one of those moments of teaching now, that you would help us to understand and to apply what you say. Amen. Um, Now, the way I want to look at this parable this morning is by thinking about three points of orientation, two good and faithful servants, and one wicked and lazy servant. So let's Look at the first few verses and think about the three points of orientation. Matthew 25 from verse 14. Jesus says, Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. So three points of orientation. Point one, it will be like Jesus starts his parable so abruptly, doesn't he? Verse 14, again, it will be like a man going on a journey and parachuting into Matthew like we've done this morning. We're kind of left wondering what will be like? What is the it he's talking about? It will be like. But if you are to cast your eyes back to the beginning of the chapter, chapter 25, verse 1, we'd see the words, the kingdom of heaven will be like. So this is how things are in God's kingdom. And specifically, given what the previous chapter, chapter 24, has been all about, this is about how we can be ready for the coming, the return of the king of God's kingdom, Jesus. So by telling us this story, by giving us this parable, Jesus is helping us to see how we're to live according to the priorities of the kingdom between now and And when he returns, it will be like. Point two, also from verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. Here is a really key thing for us to grasp 
when it comes to Jesus' story. The relationship that's on view is that of master to servant or master to slave. They are his servants, Jesus says. That'll help us understand why the first two servants responded in the way that they do. It'll also help us to understand the response that's made to the third servant, which we might find hard or extreme or over the top if we don't grasp that this is a master-servant relationship. They are his servants. And this is his property that he's entrusting to them. What the servants receive is, well, received. What they have has been given. Otherwise, they wouldn't have what they have. And so they can't claim credit. There's no room for pride. It's not a case of, well, this is mine and so I'll do with it what I want. That's a completely wrong way of thinking because what they have has been given. It's a gift. It's been entrusted to them. So the servants are also stewards. Stewards responsible for what ultimately belongs to someone else. Third point of orientation. What's been given is according to ability. See verse 15. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. It might sound obvious, but the servants, they don't all receive the same amount of money. They receive different amounts. And that's because according to the master's judgment, they don't all have the same ability. Some have more ability and so are given more money. Some have less ability and so are given less money. What's entrusted to them is according to their ability. So there's our three points of orientation. Point one, Jesus is talking about what the kingdom of heaven is like and particularly how to live in line with the values of the kingdom while we wait for the return of the king of God's kingdom, Jesus. Point two, the relationship that's on view is that of master to servant, of servants to their master. They are his servants, and this is his property that they're given. And point three, the differing amounts of money, property that the servants are given relates to their differing levels of ability. Three points of orientation. Let's move on now to think about the two good and faithful servants. Have a look with me from verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. So the master, he returns from his journey to see what his servants have done with his property. It's interesting we're told that he's gone a long time. Perhaps Jesus is wanting his listeners to realise that his return wasn't going to be as immediate and instantaneous as they might have thought. But whether the master was away a long time or a short time, it seems that it really would have made no difference whatsoever to what these first two servants do. Because back at the start of Jesus' parable, the part that we read before, we're told, verse 16, that the servant, the man who had received the five talents, went at once and put the money he'd been given to work. And verse 17, that the second servant who received the two talents did likewise. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. So the timing of the master's return was of absolutely no consequence to these servants. As soon as they're given what they're given, and as soon as he's left, they get to work. 
Notice that the response of the servants to the master as he comes to settle the accounts is pretty much identical. They both use the language of being entrusted. Verse 20 and verse 22. Remember the second of our three points of orientation. These servants, they get the master-servant relationship, don't they? They understand that they are his servants and that what they've been given is been entrusted to them. It's his property. They were given a certain amount and they both doubled that amount. The one who'd been given five talents gained five more. And the one who'd been given two talents gained two more. Notice also that the master's response to both servants is identical. The master's positive affirmation, the master's commendation, the master's reward, the master's invitation is no greater for the five-talent servant. It's no less for the two-talent servant. See, the reason I've grouped them together is because at the end of the day, there's more similarities than differences between these two servants. And I really want us to see and to grasp that. Jesus himself, in the way he tells the story, groups them together. If Matt was to put himself into the story, my hunch is, I don't know for sure, but my hunch is that Matt would consider himself a two-talent kind of guy because that's his humble way of thinking. He'd be too humble to think of himself as the five-talent guy He's always downplayed rather than paraded his gifts and abilities. Now, of course, we might disagree with his estimation of being a two-talent kind of guy, but at the end of the day, it doesn't actually matter. (laughs) And I wonder whether we really think that way. I wonder if you really believe that. Because it is so different to the way that we usually think, isn't it? It's so different from the way that we're usually taught that it doesn't actually matter whether you're a five-talent servant or a two-talent servant. In Jesus' story, they make the same response to their master and what he's given them, and the master makes the same response to them. You see, I reckon we spend way too much time comparing ourselves with other people, don't we? And it usually makes us come unstuck. (laughs) So-and-so is so much more gifted than I am. I wish I could do what he or she does. If only I had their abilities. She has so many more opportunities. He has so many more resources available to him. But at the end of the day... As we live as his people between now and Jesus' return, the way things are set up in God's economy of things, if I can put it that way, is that it doesn't actually matter whether you're a five-talent servant or a two-talent servant. If you see yourself as a servant who is serving his or her master, and if you realise that whatever has been given to you has been entrusted to you, by your master, that it's ultimately his. And so you get about being the faithful steward that he wants you to be. Your words of commendation, if you're a two-talent servant who gains two more, will be no less complimentary than the five-talent servant who gains five more. And if you're a five-talent servant... Your reward, your experience at the end of the day will be no greater, no better than that of the two-talent servant. And that is wonderfully liberating, isn't it? He's not expecting the two-talent servant to gain five more. He's expecting the two-talent servant to gain two more. Because what God is looking for, what matters to God, is that his servants be found faithful. Faithful with what they've been given. 
I'm going to read what the master says in verse 23 to the five talent servant, but I want you to read what the master says to the two talent servant in verse 21, okay? See if we can handle that. Verse 23 for me, verse 21 for you. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. What do we see? They're exactly the same words to both. Three points of orientation, two good and faithful servants. Now by way of contrast, one wicked and lazy servant. At the beginning of Jesus' parable, verse 18, we're told that the servant who received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. It's a strange response, isn't it? And a very different response from the other two servants. Now we have revealed for us why that was the case. Have a look with me at verse 24 following. Verse 24, then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has been given more, sorry, for everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What a contrast to the good and faithful servants. In this servant's response to the master, he pretty much puts it all on the master and what he's like. Did you notice that? (laughs) There's, There's no recognition of responsibility. There's no talk of being entrusted. That language is nowhere here. There's no mentality of being a steward of what he's been given. Was his master's estimation of his ability lower than he'd hoped? Did he think he was a bit hard done by that he'd only got one talent? Was he jealous of the other two servants who received five and two talents to his paltry one? As I said, he has a lot to say about his master, doesn't he? But his view of his master it just doesn't wash, does it? Because if his master really was so hard, shouldn't he, that have been more diligent rather than less? And the option the master gives him in verse 27, that he could have put the money on deposit and at least gained some interest, that doesn't sound like someone who's particularly harsh, does it? But this servant couldn't even bring himself to do that. At least that would have been doing something with what he'd been given. But he's not even prepared to take that course of action. Here is what belongs to you. You gave me this and I haven't done a single thing with it. And the wicked and lazy servant ends up losing and forfeiting even the one talent that he had. And even worse than that, the relationship with his master is severed as he, as he experiences banishment and rejection in the end. Jesus in this and many other of his parables lays the reality of judgment before his hearers. He doesn't do it unkindly. He doesn't do it to manipulate He doesn't do it to send us running scared. He does it lovingly, necessarily, and with a purpose to ensure that we'll be ready, to motivate us to live in light of it, here to get us to think about what words we'd long to hear at the end of the day when Jesus returns. 
as we think about Matt, what words he'd long to hear as he concludes this long stint of pastoral ministry. Jesus is urging and encouraging and motivating us in light of his return to use whatever we've been given, whatever we've been entrusted with, faithfully. If we've been given five talents, to be on about seeking to gain five more. If we've been given two talents, he doesn't expect five from us, but to go about seeking to gain five more. Even if it's one talent, to be faithful stewards of that. Of course, unlike the wicked and lazy servant, we live in the sure and certain knowledge that we have a kind and good and generous master, a master who loves to give good gifts to his servants. It's his property that he graciously gives and entrusts to us, isn't it? A master who would go to the cross and out of love give his life for us. That's the kind of master that we serve. See, viewing him that way makes serving him a joy and a delight and a privilege, doesn't it? Matt, as you conclude, I know your desire for each of us would be that we would continue to be faithful in what we've been given, to serve the Lord and his purposes with what we've been entrusted with, and so to hear those words for ourselves. Well done, good and faithful servant. And I I know how regularly you've said to me how encouraged you are by so many in our church who do exactly that, and I wholeheartedly agree. And for you, as you conclude, whether you've been given five talents or whether you've been given two talents or whether you've been given one talent, at the end of the day, it doesn't actually matter. With Jesus, we say, well done, good and faithful servant. And I know there are no words that you would more long to hear than those. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, echoing the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 4, we say, what do we have that we did not receive? And if we have received it, why would we boast as though we did not receive it? Father, we want to be people who are found faithful with what we've been entrusted with. Please make us more and more into servants like that. And we look forward to those wonderful words of commendation, well done good and faithful servant. And we look forward to your wonderful reward. Come and share your master's happiness. Amen.